welcome you to my lecture uh, today. Uh, today, um, we actually are going to discuss um, two-way analysis of variance and beyond. And that's why I actually call that uh, Henry uh, ANOVA. Of course, uh, I we started to wear ANOVA uh, on Wednesday. I, I walk you through a uh, statistical uh, framework, including statistical model uh, for two-way analysis of variance. And of course, um, what I'm gonna walk you through today is um, examples on two-way analysis of variance and three-way analysis of variance. Okay, so that's gonna be the focus. So in the outline, as you can see. Okay, so um, I'm basically gonna start uh, with this, with what I left uh, you with the other time. Well, if you wanna, conduct hypothesis or tests on maybe a two-way analysis of variance. Of course, I told you the other time, uh, every research question will lead to testing hypothesis. I'm gonna say that again. Every research question lead to testing uh, hypothesis. Um, if you wanna, if you have two factors, two categorical factors. Of course, you know, categorical factor actually means uh, a factor with levels. You have two categorical factors and you basically want to investigate the effects of the categorical factor separately on the response. And not only that, you also want to investigate uh, effect of interaction Okay, how are you going to go about the about that using a statistical procedure? Uh, number one thing is uh, assumptions. Of course, look how if you see what I'm displaying now, because that will require us using statistical model, and every statistical model has assumptions, and the only way we can trust that particular model is when assumption holds. I remember the other time I told you um, if a court is entertaining a case and that very case, uh, that court does not have a territorial jurisdiction. If uh, whatever, even if the court is telling the truth, whatever decision they make, will be declared non and void because of the fact that they do not have the territorial jurisdiction to the case. We also have that in statistic. They will in terms of assumptions. Okay, uh, the second step is hypothesis. If you're working with two-way analysis of variance, we're gonna have hypothesis for factor A we're going to have hypothesis for factor B. We're also going to have hypothesis for the interaction, making three set of hypotheses. You remember the other time I started uh, with you on one example, where, well, uh, an interesting example where we're trying to use a sandwich data. On that same data, we've used one way analysis of variance. Why? Because we consider one factor type of sandwiches. But what if in a situation where we also want to consider another factor bread and the bread also has levels. What I'm displaying now, the first hypothesis that you can see is the interaction between um, you know, bread and the type of sandwich because uh, we can have a situation whereby the effect of the type of sandwiches on, you know, on, on attracting uh, ant may depends on the type of bread. That is what interaction is talking about. Interaction 
is synonymous with relationship. Then from there, you're going to test hypothesis uh, due to feelings, then hypothesis due to bread, making three set of hypotheses. The three set of hypotheses will require the use of uh, three p-values, one p-value for each. And as you can see in the data, if you look at the step three now, uh, if you already have your data set in R, okay, the two-way ANOVA code is just going to be AOV into uh, your response variable on the file. That is the file, the, the, what you see as file in here is the first factor, the second factor is bread, and the third factor is going to be an interaction, as you can see, the filing and the bread. Of course, when I do the summary of that, we have an ANOVA table presented. Of course, the result of um, uh, the analysis of variance, we always uh, end up in ANOVA table. And in the ANOVA table, you're basically going to have access to a lot of information. But the, 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 the important information in this table is the last column. Even though there's no way you're going to get to the last column without starting from the first column. And that was the reason why in the ongoing assignment, I ask you to compute uh, you know, certain tags by hand so that you will be able to see uh, the, you know, what normally happens behind the scene when you are using R, okay? Now, looking at the P uh, value column, which is the last column in the table, you're actually gonna look at the P value associated with the first factor, with the second factor, and that of the interaction. Now, the p-value associated with the first factor, as you can see here, is less than 0 0.05. So which means it is uh, the effect of the type of sandwiches on the attracting um, hand is significant. So which means there's a significant difference in the type of sandwiches with regard to uh, you know, the rate at which they attract hand. But when you look at the different types of bread, you know, the degree of freedom I'm seeing for different types of bread is three. It means uh, four levels of bread was used. Of course, uh, the p-value is 0 0.581. That is greater than 0 0.05. Then it means there's no significant difference when you put into consideration the levels of bread. When you also look at the interaction effect as well, you know, it's not significant. You know, looking at this two-way analysis of variance now, what this is suggesting to us, the one way and one way ANOVA would be better than doing this. Because the effect of the second factor and the interactions are is not significant. So why do I need to waste? Why do I need to go for a complex model when a simple model can do the job? If one way ANOVA can do the job, why do I go for two way ANOVA? So the only way to sustain the two way ANOVA is uh, when, um, in addition to the factor A, any other uh, effect can be significant. This is an interaction plot. You know, I justify, I told you the other time, we normally talk about interaction. Uh, if we have from two factors and above, because two factors can interact. What is the meaning? The meaning is just like, maybe the, um, the response variable, I mean, the factor, the first factor, the behavior of the first factor with regard to the response is not consistent at different levels of, of the other factor. I'm going to say that again. We don't need interaction if a particular factor has a consistent behavior across levels of the other factor. But if it has inconsistent behavior, then there's an interaction effect. That's all we need. Okay. Uh, 
I, I want to show you uh, Moody, Moody building. I, I know this is what, uh, you know, some people or some students normally see that they, you know, they get scared away with, you know, from statistics or from any mathematical related discipline because uh, the, the way we write our model has a lot of mathematical notations. But let me tell you this, these are very, very easy. Very, very easy if you try to understand what a particular notation represents. I told you the other time, the way I learn mathematics, the way I learn statistics, I follow whatever my professor do with a practical mind, not just theoretical mind. If I follow that with a theoretical mind only, that would that would look more abstract to me, and it's not it's not going to make sense. You know, when my my child in the middle school comes home at times, and is going to say, "Dad, what is the essence of x plus y equal to five? What is the meaning of this?" In my according to her, she's going to say, "This is jargons. Doesn't really make sense." But you know what I said? You know what I said? This is going to make sense. Let's do it this way. Let's say X represent the price of cookies and Y represent the price of candies. My mother is going to say, yes, I know cookies. I know candies. And of course, with that, it will, she will have interest in doing that. So which means if you basically want to do well in any mathematically related uh, discipline, you need to get yourself familiar with notations. You need to be able to relate every symbol to real life, practical situation. Take a look at what I'm trying to display now. We got three modules. If you look at the first one, error I, J, K, do you know what we're telling the world? We're telling the world every specification of statistical model as an error component. I'm going to say that again. Every specification of statistical model as an error component. What do you think we're telling the world? Incorporating error into our model is an acknowledgement that our model can never capture exact reality. That is what it means. We are already acknowledging that. And we expect that even though we are incorporating a random component called error into our model, we want the error to behave well. When error behaves well, it means absorption old. I'm going to say that again. The only condition under which error behaves well is when absorption old, because absorptions are centered on the errors. And we expect that the error follow normal distribution, as you can see, with the mean of zero. What is the meaning? Mean of zero. Oh, on average, the effect of what I cannot control is very, very small. Is more or less zero. That's what we mean. Because it is not everything your model can control. And it should have a constant variance, sigma squared. That's what you see. Now, when you take a look at it, the the other model, you know, why I, you're going to see that every other model that you see, we have that error component. Now, the first one, mu plus alpha high plus EIJ, that's a, that's a one way and over. Maybe the one way and over, the alpha high there may be talking about the effect of sandwiches. And the second one where I have YIJK mu plus beta J, maybe the beta J is talking about the effect of the type of bread. And the third one, which is y i j k equal mu plus alpha high plus beta j plus alpha beta i j plus the error i j k, maybe that is a two way analysis of variance model with interaction where the mu is just talking about the overall effect, the mean effect, the alpha high is talking about effect of the type of sandwiches and the beta J talking about effect of types of bread and the alpha beta IJ talking about the effect of the interaction of the type of sandwiches and the levels of bread. <laughs> Look at the way I just uh, explained each of that, uh, each of the time. 
The moment you understand each of the terms, statistics course, mathematics will be the simplest course ever. And I said, do not consider. Why is it that we shouldn't consider? Look at why IJK equal to mu plus alpha high plus alpha beta. How can I be talking? How can I consider investigating interaction between two factors and I only measure the main effect of only one of the factor? That doesn't make sense. I'm talking about this guy now. The YIJK, number one in do not consider. You can say an interaction, but you are only considering the main effect of a factor. You are not considering the main effect of the second factor, but you are considering the interaction. It doesn't make sense. That's why you shouldn't consider that. You should not also consider the second one. Look at that. If they do not consider, how can you consider only factor B as well as the factor interaction of factor A and B, but you don't consider the main effect of factor A? That doesn't make sense. But what about the last one in do not consider? Oh my God, you did not consider factor A. You did not consider factor B, but you are only testing uh, interaction effect between factor A and factor B. That is not a good uh, hypothesis at all to consider. Is there any question on do not consider any question? Do you understand that, right? Why you shouldn't consider all those three modules, right? Okay, you can't talk about interaction without also investigating separately factor A, factor B. That is why you shouldn't consider them. Uh, if you take a look at what I'm trying to show you now, of course, this is what I just uh, showed you the other time, uh, the result of uh, two-way analysis of variance with uh, interaction. I think we've uh, already taken a uh, decision uh, with this. Take a look at this guy. This is when I'm considering uh, two-way analysis of variance without interaction. You know, when we consider with interaction, you, you, this is what we have. The factor B is not significant. Factor B is bred. And the interaction effect is not also significant. And maybe the reason why it is not significant is because um, we maybe we have uh, considered interaction. What of if we don't consider interaction, what happened? When we don't consider interaction in this research, we still realize that factor B is not significant. What is this telling us? This is actually telling you why not considering only factor A. Or if there is any other factor available, apart from factor B, can you bring it in? Because the only way we can minimize bias, let me tell you this, the worst enemy, the worst, the worst uh, enemy, the worst enemy of every researcher is re reducing bias, okay? Reducing bias, okay? Now, what normally costs bias is when an important factor is missing in your model. If, if a factor that have effect on the response. Because when you don't include that in your model, do you know where you are putting it? You're putting it in the error. Anything that you put inside the error, you are trying to tell the world, it, it is not relevant. <laughs> That's why you are putting it in the error. Okay, now uh, take a look at this. I, I will, not, will not want to consider another two factor experiment. Where we're going to talk about type of sandwich, oh, sorry, three factor uh, experiment where without interaction, because we realize that it is not only type of bread, it is not only type of sandwich. What about whether the bread has butter or not? So we're bringing in the third factor now. This is an example of a three way ANOVA because we're considering three categorical factors. The first factor is, uh, you know, type of sandwiches. There are three levels of them. That's why the degree of freedom is two. The second factor is type of bread. There are four levels of them. That's why the degree of freedom is three. The third factor is the border, whether it has border or not. Okay, that's yes or no, two levels. That's why the degree of freedom is one. But when we bring in 
effect of border. Oh my God, it's significant. Look at that. The effect of uh, you know the the filing is significant. They call the p-value is less than 0 0.05. Border is significant. Bread is not significant. And let me tell you this: it means using one way analysis of variance. Okay, we the, we 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 actually mislead because an important factor is missing. What was the factor that was missing? The border that is significant now. Because when a factor is significant, it means it is relevant. If you don't consider it, you actually, you're, you're actually going to increase your bias. And the moment you increase bias, you're basically going to mislead. We don't want to mislead. We don't want a situation whereby we spend a lot of time We've committed a lot of resources, energy, time, money on our research. But at the end of the day, we are being let down by poor statistical tool or the fact that we don't review the literature very well. Because before you know what to test, you need to be informed. How can you be informed? You need to review research literature, research article. That will tell you what are the important factors. What are the factors that you that you need to actually test? We don't go into research with an empty mind. There's always going to be something in our mind going into research. Only that we shouldn't allow what we have in mind to influence our results. No way. But we're always going to have something in mind. Our mind can never be empty. Okay, so this is just giving you the means of uh, each of the factor across levels. Now, you know, initially, if you take a look at what I did here, this is three way ANOVA, three factor ANOVA without interaction. Do you know the meaning of without interaction? Here, it means factor A, behavior or the performance of factor A on the response is consistent putting into consideration the level of other factor. The performance of factor B, bread, is consistent. Okay, putting into consideration the level of other factor. The, perfor the performance of uh, factor C, which is border, is consistent. When I say consistent, this is what I mean. Con you know, consistent. Yeah, consistent. But what of in a situation where the performance of a factor is not consistent? Maybe the performance of a factor on the response depends on the levels of another factor. Then in that situation, I'm basically going to consider three-way ANOVA with interaction. I want you to take a look at it. Oh my God, we have an extended ANOVA table now you know look at the filing the bread the border those are the main effects of factor we have interaction effect you know the, we have a two-way interaction effect three-way interaction effect if you look at the first effect filling and bread filling and border butter and butter, uh, bread and butter then the last interaction where you're going to have the combination of the three you know what this is trying to tell us if any of those interactions is significant, you know what he's telling the world. Particularly, I'm going to tell you, if you look at the, uh, the three-way interaction, the feeling, bread, and butter, that is significant. It's zero, the p-value is 0 0.02221. What that is suggesting is that the behave, the performance of a factor, particularly the performance of filing, on the response is what is not consistent putting into consideration the other the the, the levels the, the levels of the other factors that is what it means and what is the model for this three way and over with interaction i'm going to show you now oh my god this is the model look at that Y I J K L. Why do I have Y I J K L? Okay, the Y I J K that will that will go for three factors. 
Okay, the head, of course, you're going to have the arrow. Look at that now. Alpha high, that is the main effect of factor A. Beta J, that is the main effect of factor B. Gamma K, that is the main effect of factor C. Alpha, beta, I, J, that is the interaction effect of factor A and B. Uh, alpha, gamma, that is the interaction effect of factor A and factor C. Uh, beta, gamma, J, K, that is the interaction effect of factor B and C. And the last one, alpha, beta, gamma, that is the interaction effect of the three factors combined. And the E, I, J, K, L is the error component. This is the way this the model should be written. I'm going to show you, you know, if you look at the first, you know, you know when, I, when you need to follow first in the, when you are writing the model, you need to be done with the first factor. Look at that. Alpha I, beta J, gamma K. After that, I, I, you know, you need to be systematic in writing it. What would be the first two to combine? It would be alpha times beta, is it not? That was why we have alpha beta. You know, you use alpha on beta, right? You use alpha, you use alpha on beta to get this. The next thing is use alpha on gamma to get this. The next thing is use beta on gamma to get this. The next thing is combination of all the three. This is the uh, this is the way we want it. It shouldn't. This arrangement should not be altered. It should always you should always follow this arrangement when you are writing the model. But you know what? When you are writing the ANOVA table, you're also going to follow this arrangement. In the ANOVA table, if you're talking about three factor, the first, in the first column, the first three things that you're going to see should be the main effect, factor A, B, C, followed by the two-way interaction. And the last one is going to be three-way. Let's go back to the table. Oh my God, that's exactly what I'm seeing now. Look at the first three, filing bread, butter. That is the main effect of each factor, followed by the uh, first order interaction and followed by the second order interaction. And that is to tell you we are executing. What are, you exe what are we executing in uh, another table? We're looking at the model. It is the model that is guiding us to know what to execute. And the next thing you basically uh, seeing there is, the, uh, you know, when you take a look at the model, we have a error IJKL, which is the place of unexplained, we call that unexplained or unobserved effect. But you know what, even though we may not exactly know the unobserved effect, unobserved effects here may be other factors that may have effect on the response, but maybe their effect is not expected to be significant. And that is the reason why we don't include them in the table. That is what, I mean, in the model. That's what we call the, un, you know, the unobserved effect. But let me tell you this, because of the fact that the only way to tell if our model is doing a great job is to actually investigate whether absorption hold and the absorption center on the error. So how are we actually going to know whether absorption hold if we're not able to obtain the unobserved? And that is the reason why we try in the statistics to estimate the unobserved. That is what you see as ECAP. We now call that residual. When you estimate unobserved effect, we call it residual. In the module, it is not residual. Does he have a cap? He doesn't have a cap. Look at that in the module. Error I, J, K, L is an error. But when you put a cap on it, error I, J, K, L cap, that becomes residual because the residual is an estimate of the error. You are estimating the error. And what is the meaning? That is going to be the difference between what the model suggests and what happened in reality. I'm going to say that again. The estimate of residual is the difference between what your model suggests and what happened in reality. 
Look at that. The YIJK head, that is the actual response. The YIJK uh, cap, that is a predicted response. Where is the predicted response coming from? From your model. The distance, the distance between the actual response and the predicted response is the residual, which we call a gap. The more the gap, then you can, the less you're going to trust your model. We want a situation where the gap is going to be narrower. But let me tell you this, the gap can never be zero. The distance can never be zero. There's always going to be the difference between what your module suggests and what happened in reality. Because from day one, we incorporate error into our module. We acknowledge the fact that module can never give exact reality. You know, I love statistics a lot because statistics is telling us a story, a story that you can confirm. That is a true picture of reality. Now, what, I, what do you want to do here? How can I trust my model? You know, that was why we estimated residual in the first place. And uh, we can generate, you know, we have assumptions uh, underlying the use of analysis of variance, whether one way, two way, three way, or what, or, or irrespective of the numbers of factors, we have assumption, assumptions of independence, assumptions of normality, assumptions of constant variance, you know, assumptions of the absence of outlier, and so on like that. How can we test them? How can we see? That's exactly what we want to do here. The moment we get our residual, we can generate a residual plot. Okay, when we generate residual plots, we can actually see, you know, whether the assumptions of cost and variance hold. Okay, then we can do, look at the QQ norm. The QQ norm will help us to test whether the assumptions of normality hold. And of course, you can also use um, what we call, um, uh, the Shapiro wiki test of normality. So there are several ways to, you know, indicate, you know, to investigate how valid is our model. There's no way you'll be able to tell if you don't estimate error that we call residual. And that's what we start with normally say analysis of residual. The analysis of residual is more or less uh, talking about, you know, investigating whether absorption old. This is a residual plot. This is a normal QQ plot. If you take a look at this guy now, it's giving me a sense that, oh, uh, because I don't expect all the points to be on the straight line because we don't have a perfect model before we can follow normal distribution. If the majority of that can be on that diagonal straight line, we are fine. That's a normality. Okay. Now we also do comparison tests. The only way you go for comparison test, whether you do one way ANOVA or two way ANOVA, or three way ANOVA or whatever way ANOVA, the moment the non hypothesis is rejected, then you need to pursue your test for that. Because the analysis of variance has a disadvantage of not telling us where the difference lies. It doesn't tell us where the difference lies, if there's a difference. And the only way to tell where the difference lies is to consider multiple comparison tests. I presented some multiple comparison tests to you the other time. I said some are liberal, some are conservative. Some are more liberal, some are more conservative. But we have identified some that are really moderate, less conservative, less liberal. In the name of a Turkey HSD test and the buffer running test, and don't also forget Donet. We use Donet in the case you want to compare the level of a factor with a control. So take a look at this. Why am I, uh, you know, you know, conducting this in the three-way ANOVA? Because when I conducted uh, in the three-way ANOVA table here, filing was significant. There are three there are three levels of them. We need to conduct a talkie, a comparison test to be able to know where the different lies. We also need to do that 
for butter. Look at butter. But can somebody tell me for extra credit, looking at this table for butter, why do you think I don't necessarily, even though butter is significant as it is being displayed in this table, why is it that I don't even need to go for multiple comparison tests for butter? Can somebody tell me for extra credit? I want you to look at the, uh, you know, what I'm projecting now. Okay. Uh, why is it, you know, butter is significant, right? And when when it is, when the factor is significant, we pursue, uh, a, you know, a multiple comparison test to know where different lies. But why is it that, is it not necessary uh, to do it for butter here? Can somebody tell me for extra credit? Why is it not, why is it not necessary? And, you know, I did it for filing, right? For filing is significant. That is what we're doing here. I'm going to show you now for filing. That's what we're doing here. This is for filing, right? We did multiple comparison tests for filing. Okay. Why is it that I don't necessarily need a uh, multiple comparison test for butter? Why? Why? Can somebody tell me? Looking at the uh, results here, why is it that I don't necessarily need it? Go ahead. Which indicates how many levels which means you already know where the different lies. Good job. Extra credit. Send it to me. When the levels of treatment is two, you don't need multiple comparison. You already know where the different lies. <laughs> and you know the reason? Let's take a look at the p-value for butter in this table. What is the p-value? 0 0.00355, right? Even when you conduct multiple comparison tests, what do you have? You will have the same p-value. Do you say the same p-value? Is 0 0.00355 for uh, butter? So the only reason why you need to pursue a multiple comparison test when the level of factor is more than two. But when you only have two levels, the result in the ANOVA table is, uh, is sufficient to know where the different lies. Okay. Advantages and disadvantages. You know, this design, we call it factorial design. Why is it factorial? Because you have more than one factor. Whether two-way, three-way, you have factorial design. Now, advantages are more efficient than one at a time. Instead of me to, if I have three factors and I pursue that uh, one, at a, one at a time, maybe I look at the effect of factor A separately in one model, factor B separately in one model, factor C, that's, that's a waste of time. Why not simultaneously looking at the effect in one model? And that's why we say it's more efficient than one at a time strategy, which can lead to wrong decision. Because one at a time strategy will not consider another potential factor. But when you when you when you actually investigate uh, all these factors in one model, that will be gainful to the economy and uh, to the scientific community. They can study interaction between two or more factors. Because if you're only looking at one at a time, there's no way you can incorporate interaction. Then what there are disadvantages? Let me tell you, as the numbers of factors is increasing, <laughs> then it means you're going to perform so many experiments. And that will be costly. Don't forget we're limited by budget. But how are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? Will lead us to another topic in this course that we call fractional factorials. What do we mean fractional? Fractional. Don't perform all the experiment. Can you just perform some that are, that are likely to be significant? Because why do I need to waste my time, you know, on experiment that on the, uh, on the long run will not be significant? Why am I wasting my time? So the fractional factorial will be a way out. The fractional factorial is like using experience. I'm not going to perform all the treatment combination. I'm only going to focus on some that I know that will be significant at the end of the day. Then interpretation of higher order interaction uh, may be difficult. Now, what is the take home message? With more factors, uh, you know, need to consider interaction. 
when you have a uh, more than one factor of course interaction is going to come in and then you know the principle of ANOVA remain the principle remain in terms of getting uh, some of square within some of square between uh, including the assumptions then the, the best design is a balanced uh, design. What do I mean by balanced design? The numbers you, con you consider in each group is, is the same. We call that equi-replicates. Because we also have unbalanced design. Okay, we also have unbalanced design, so which we're gonna talk about uh, in this course. The not good if the number of factors increase. I told you, when the numbers of factors increase, you're gonna spend money. You're gonna spend that, you know, it's gonna take time, you know, considering running experiment on different or uh, treatment combination, but when the sample, there's a difference between, when sample size increases and when the numbers of factors increases. When the sample size increases, that would be, that, that's good. You remember we need a last sample? Uh, I promise, uh, this is gonna be the last slide, but I promise uh, I was gonna, since I still have time, I'm gonna give you my own example of three-way factor, you know, just like, what I also, I will also advise that you also give your own example. I'll give you one example now, you know, example of three-way uh, ANOVA in sports. Maybe you actually introduce, I'm gonna start from sports. You introduce um, a regime, two training, two uh, training regime, okay? Uh, you know, training, regime okay they are one versus two okay that's fact one factor then divisions and gender now your response variable your response variable is um you know jumping height jumping height of college uh basket basketball players this is an example of a three-way anova you want to increase the jumping oh if i you know the the uh if you want to make more baskets you know that depends on the ability you know to jump you know what i mean and you are testing whether uh, two different training regime will lead to the uh increasing in the jumping you know and not only that, you put into consideration the divisions, because I know the college, those of you that are familiar with the college basketball, they have divisions. I don't know that division one, two, and three, that's categorical. Then you also want to consider gender, okay? This is an example of three-way analysis of variance. So this is in sports. Another example of three-way analysis of variance, you're looking at uh, effects of uh, drug, okay? Uh, effect, okay, of drug, Okay, on the effect of drug on, on certain medical condition, certain um, medical condition. Okay, now in the effect of drug, maybe you consider uh, control. Okay, and maybe those one, those two. And not only that, you consider the gender of the subject, you also consider the ethnicity. <laughs> ethnicity. Maybe you realize that the drug has the positive effect. Let's say, for instance, we have a male and female here. Ethnicity, let's say, um, Caucasian, African American, and Hispanic. Maybe this drug has a positive effect on males in general. Okay. But has little effect on male that are African-American, that's an interaction, which means the effect of the drug on a certain, on a, on a particular gender depends, okay, depends on ethnicity. That's an interaction. This is another example of three-way uh, analysis of variance. Let me think of other one. Oh, see psychology. I love psychology. Okay. In psychology, I'm going to give you an example. I, I want to look at the effects of educational attainment, educational 
attainment, employment status, employment status, socioeconomic status, socioeconomic status. Each of these, they are factor. And I want to look at this effect on the response variable is the number, the number of children, the number of children, the number of children by maybe if by a female, by female respondents. You want to see whether there's a different, there's a significant difference in the numbers of uh, children, okay, for female, for, for people in different uh, educational attainment, employment status, and socioeconomic uh, status. That's another example of three-way ANOVA, and I'm kind of challenging you to also give your own example. I think lastly, I'm going to give example from agriculture because I like uh, agriculture a lot. I remember in Africa, I used to go to farm like, but I'm missing that. That is the only thing I'm missing, you know. I, I like going to farm because, uh, you know, the moment there is food, everybody will be fine, you know. So now I want to look at the effect of um, maybe what what frequency, whether I uh, I water my plants weekly or daily, the water frequency, exposure to sunlight, and fertilizers on plant growth. Look at that, because and there could be interaction. Maybe uh, the the effect of the fertilizer on the I mean, uh, maybe the effect of uh, sunlight on plant growth may depends on the rate at which you watered your plant, whether weekly or daily. You know, there's so many examples, and I'm challenging you today to also cite your own example. The moment you cite your example, you are good. Example can come from any area of life. Any question before I go today? Oh, it's another weekend. Make sure you enjoy your weekend. And of course, next week, uh, what we're going to do is to walk you through midterm one practice questions to give you information about what you need in the exam. To give information about that, I'm going to dedicate the whole class for that. Okay, make sure you stay safe. Have a lovely day. Bye for now, everyone. No, there's not, no, there, you know, if you check the syllabus, I write no assignment in the week of a midterm. No assignment in the week of a week time. Oh, uh, give me one second. I think uh, somebody, oh, thank you too. Thank you, the guy online. Have a nice weekend.